Hello and welcome back to The World Tree and the series Introduction to European Paganism. I am Stefan Cvetkovic and in this episode we will talk about the nature of the divine in the pre-Christian European worldview. Before we begin, I would like to invite you to subscribe to this channel and like the videos, if you truly like them, of course, and therefore help the channel grow. Likewise, I would like to inform you that uh, when this series of videos is over, it will be published as a book which will be available on Amazon like the rest of my books, which you can find in the links below. The difference between this series and the book is of course the format, but also that the book will contain illustrations regarding the topics discussed, as well as descriptions and therefore additional information which is not included in the series. So if you really value these lectures and wish uh, to own a physical copy that you can pass on to your children or if something unexpected happens to this channel in the, and the content is lost, then uh, I invite you to consider purchasing the book when it is published. By doing so, you are, uh, you're also helping me put my bread on the table, so to speak, and uh, in return you get something very good. Thank you for being here and for having interest in my work. And now, let us begin. The Nature of the Divine In the mythology of Europe, we find numerous beings who were regarded as deities and who held a special position of power and admiration in the religious life of our forebears. However, the deities that we are familiar with and which are usually represented in an anthropomorphic way do not always appear as such, but are a result of uh, historical development of our religious tradition. The earliest cult of Eurasia is the ancestral cult, which is inseparable from the cult of the cave bear which the Neanderthals had despite the various disagreements regarding its existence among scholars. We know this to be true from various archaeological sites in which the bones or skulls of cave bears have been carefully arranged in a specific way. But probably the most important archaeological site is that of uh, Le Rigordou in France, where the skull of the Neanderthal skeleton was missing while the thigh bone was replaced by that of a cave bear. The bear was therefore seen as a sacred animal, as some of the ancestors, respected and honored in various ways, and its cult survived throughout the centuries in a slightly altered form throughout the deities such as Artio, Veles, Artemis, and others, as well as through annual rituals and dances related to its hibernation all over Europe. However, the bear was not the only animal regarded as sacred by our Stone Age forebears, but in fact every animal and every living being was, because in those times our ancestors were still animists. Animism is a term developed by anthropologists to describe the religious customs of primitive people from all over the world, hence why it is sometimes referred to as the oldest religion despite it not having any form of religious doctrine. The term animism is derived from the Latin word anima, meaning simply spirit, and it implies that all beings and things have a spirit, or simply that they are alive. Because the distinction between matter and spirit was unknown prior to the conversion to Christianity, as the word for spirit in most European languages simply means breath. Therefore, having a spirit simply means breathing or more generally interacting with the environment, which is the case for all living beings. As such, the original animistic worldview did not recognize the existence of deities which were venerated, but rather the existence of spirits who could be manipulated and whose favor could be gained through the form of imitative magic. 
animism therefore means that the spirit and matter are inseparable. That is to say that the matter is infinitely spiritual. In a way, it is the realization that all matter is infinitely deep, and thus infinity can be realized through everything that exists. Despite the fact that the spirits of nature eventually evolved to the deities which were later personified, the primordial animistic worldview is something that persisted through the centuries of historical development of our cults. The only possible way to understand that all matter is infinitely deep is by changing our modern perspective of linear time and realizing that the only real time is the present and that it is infinite. It is only when we realize this that we can grasp the true meaning of our ancient rituals in which various natural and man-made objects were venerated or regarded as being possessed by spirits. For example, in the previous lecture regarding the concept of divine honor, we saw that the objects of ancestors and heroes were kept in the temples or in the family home. They were exhibited for people to see, interact with, listen to the tales and songs that surrounded them or inherit them from one generation to another. Likewise, in our tradition there is also the custom of naming various items, such as rings or weapons. And in certain areas of the time periods of Europe we have the recorded custom of digging up the grave or burial mound and collecting some of the items the dead were buried with. Similar to the Neanderthal burial, where the skull was collected. All of these customs can be explained when we consider the animistic worldview of our forebears. If existence does not have a beginning and an end, thus making time not linear but eternal, only perceived as past, present and future due to our senses, it means that it is very easy to bring the past into the present. It means that matter is infinitely deep and therefore by interacting with something our ancestors did, we have the ability of recollecting memories of our previous selves in our previous lives. Hence why the objects of our forebears or the heroes were regarded as sacred, because their spirit was embedded in them, and by seeing or recollecting the ancestral objects as well as hearing the mythical songs and tales, we tune into the memory of the object or place and remember ourselves. We take part in eternity. As such, prayers related to the dead are essentially animistic, because the spirit of the dead is considered to reside in all the objects. They are haunted by the spirit of the dead, or rather by the memory. Therefore, it is important to understand that at the core of all European beliefs lies reincarnation, meaning the belief that one's spirit is immortal and can be incarnated in a new physical body. And by the act of imitation and repetition, that is to say, performing the same rites, owning the same objects, and so forth, one can remember who he really is. The understanding of reincarnation, or metempsychosis, as the ancient Greeks called it, is not only evident in the historical and ethnographic sources of all European people, but it has survived even among us. Many of us are named after our grandparents and great-grandparents, and it is not uncommon to find a name repeating itself through the family tree, stemming from the patron saint of the family, which was originally the divine progenitor. This perfectly illustrates our ancestral belief that the spirit and spiritual qualities of a person are linked to his or her name. And therefore, if a person was honorable, the name and deeds of this person would be remembered eternally 
because that person would be repeatedly reborn through the generations carrying the same name. However, if we go far back in time, a single individual will be the progenitor of a whole tribe, people or nation. If we dig up a Neanderthal grave, that person is a common ancestor to all Europeans. And so in the same way, the name of a family progenitor can repeat itself throughout the generations, for they all carry his spirit. Because just as we can observe the characteristics of our ancestors in our physical appearance, so we can in our spirit, in our strength and weaknesses, our talents, abilities, interests and so forth. For our forebears, the most distant ancestors and progenitors were the gods. And it was them who brought forth the cosmic order, according to which people's customs, rights and societies were arranged. Every ritual act, be it a wedding, a burial, a harvest or a blood sacrifice, was a repetition of a divine act originally performed by the progenitors, that is to say the gods. Most of these rituals were performed annually because our pre-Christian calendar correlates certain parts of the year with mythical events, making each year a repetition of the mythical age during which the birth, life and death of the deities occurred and was re-enacted in the festivals. As such, our forebears lived in an eternal, cyclical time, and not a linear and historical time as modern man does. Our myths are embedded in the calendar, hence the great importance of celebrating the festivals properly. By doing that, we reenact the myths and transcend time, because the myth is the memory. As a matter of fact, all of this can be scientifically proven if our current scientific understanding was not based on beliefs and dogmas. One of the scientists which has exposed and challenged the current state of science is Rupert Sheldrake, who suggests that instead of following fixed laws of nature created with the Big Bang, nature is governed by habits. That is to say, he suggests that memory is inherent to nature and that natural systems inherit a collective memory from all previous things of their kind, however far they were and however long ago they existed. For example, as a swallow grows up, it flies, feeds, preens, migrates, mates and nests as swallows habitually do. It inherits the instincts of its species through invisible influences that make the behavior of past swallows present within it. It draws on and is shaped by the collective memory of its species. All humans too draw on a collective memory, to which all in turn contribute. As such, our own personal habits may depend on influences from our past behavior to which we tune in. But the same could be also said in relation to our most distant ancestors. If so, there is no need for memories to be stored in a material form in our brains, as modern science has failed to prove. The past may become present to us directly if we simply tune into it, which is what all of our rituals and myths about. Rupert Sheldrake suggests that this occurs through fields which he calls morphic fields, and that each natural system has its own kind of field. When organisms cease to exist, the morphic fields do not disappear, because they are potential organizing patterns of influence that can appear physically in other times and places, whenever and wherever the physical conditions are appropriate. When they do, they contain within themselves a memory of their previous physical existences. 
as he writes in his book, The Presence of the Past, the process by which the past becomes present within morphic fields is called morphic resonance. Morphic resonance involves the transmission of formative causal influences through both time and space. The memory within the morphic fields is cumulative, and that is why all sorts of things become increasingly habitual through repetition. When such repetition has occurred on an astronomical scale over billions of years, as it has in the case for many kinds of atoms, molecules and crystals, the nature of these things has become deeply habitual that it is effectively changeless or seemingly eternal. This collective memory, which is inherent to all species, is what Jung called the collective unconscious. Jung wrote as follows. The collective unconscious is a part of the psyche which can be negatively distinguished from a personal unconscious by the fact that it does not, like the latter, owe its existence to personal experience and consequently it is not a personal acquisition. While the personal unconscious is made up eventually of contents which have at one time been conscious but have disappeared from consciousness through have been forgotten or repressed, the contents of the collective unconscious have never been in consciousness and therefore have never been individually acquired but owe their existence exclusively to heredity. Whereas the personal unconscious consists for the most part of complexes, the content of the collective unconscious is made up essentially of archetypes. One of the reasons why Jung adopted this idea was because, through his more than half a century of experience, he discovered recurrent patterns in dreams and myths which suggested the existence of unconscious archetypes, which he interpreted as a kind of inherent collective memory. His idea was clearly incompatible with the conventional mechanic understanding that heredity depends on information coded in the DNA molecules, because that couldn't explain how, for example, a Swiss person could have a dream that seemed to arise from the same archetype as a myth from the Yoruba tribe of Africa. Nevertheless, although Jung regarded the collective unconscious as common to all humanity, he did not regard it as entirely undifferentiated, for he said that with the beginning of racial differentiation, essential differences were developed in the collective psyche as well. This means that, despite the fact that all of humanity shares the same collective unconscious and therefore some mythological structures or symbols are shared between cultures which have never been in contact, they are nevertheless different and unique in their own way, as we all are humans, but racially different. The psychologist Marie-Louise von Franz, a friend of Jung, took this further by saying that below the personal unconscious lies a group unconscious of families, clans and tribes. Below this is a common unconscious of wide national units, and below it lies the sum of those universal psychic archetypal structures that we share with the whole mankind. According to Sheldrake, such a conception is in general agreement with the idea of morphic resonance, the specificity of which depends on similarity. Members of particular social groups are in general more similar to past members of the same groups than to social groups of entirely different races and cultures. But underlying all human groups are general similarities through which all participate in a common human heritage. Therefore, this book is called Introduction to European Paganism because it deals with concepts which were common to all pre-Christian people of Europe and not the specific characteristics of the various European people. Everything previously said by Sheldrake, Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz 
is entirely compatible with our pre-Christian worldview and tradition, and it is perfectly summed up by the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, who said the following. The philosophers say that they are gods, and that their will directs the universe. The more important lesson is to discover the nature of the gods. Upon discovering that nature, a man would please the gods by making his own nature like unto the gods. If the divine is faithful, he must also be faithful. If free, he must also be free. If beneficent, he must also be beneficent. If magnanimous, he must also be magnanimous. Thus, to make the gods' nature one's own, a man must imitate them in every thought, word, and deed. With this statement, Epictetus summed up the meaning of our pre-Christian religious traditions. The best way to honor our ancestors and the gods is to become them, to follow what they have done and align our nature with theirs. In traditional societies there is no sense of progressive development. What happens now repeats what happened before, and as was previously said, this repetition always refers to the first time it happened, in the mythic time of origins. This time was in the past, but it also becomes the present because the original patterns are continually repeated. And although some customs and traditions are lost, most of them are still being kept alive by people who don't even know why they are doing that, simply because it is a part of their collective memory. We can take as an example the custom of decorating a Christmas, or rather Yule tree, which did not exist prior to the 17th century. The way the Yule tree has caught on in various countries and rapidly took foot, so that most people actually believe it is an age-old custom, is only proof that its appeal is rooted in the depths of our spirit, of our psyche, in the depths of our collective memory or collective unconscious, for it is an archetypal image of the cosmic tree, with its lights representing the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon and stars. This fidelity to the past, regarded as a timeless model, is alien to our modern way of thinking. We see the past in terms of stages in a progressive historical process. But in traditional societies, the mythical attitude prevailed. Every technique, rule and custom was justified by the argument that the ancestors taught us to do it. The main difference between modern theories of progress and traditional myths is that the theories do not refer back to original models in the past, but refer to future goals, often envisioned as states of peace, prosperity and brotherhood. But the fact is that by negating the past, especially the divine customs, we create chaos in the present and cannot bring anything into the future. The notion of progress has developed due to the Judeo-Christian tradition, and the most distinctive feature of this tradition is its myths of history, rather its myth of history, the idea of historical progress towards an end that in some sense recreates the primal paradise before the fall. The creation theories of modern science were inspired by this Judeo-Christian cultural matrix, with the paradigmatic theory of a beginning and the belief in historical progress towards the end of history, the Big Bang theory and the modern doctrine of universal evolution bear a striking resemblance to the Judeo-Christian foundation myth, which is especially interesting when we consider that the theory was proposed by a Jesuit Catholic priest. Nevertheless, 
this essentially pre-Christian fidelity to the mythical past did survive in many religious traditions, because ritual forms are highly conservative. The gestures and actions should be done in the correct way. Ritual forms of language are conserved even when the language is no longer in everyday use. Thus, until the 1960s, the Roman Catholic liturgy was in Latin, the Brahimic rituals of India are in Sanskrit, and the liturgy of the Coptic Church is in the extinct language of ancient Egypt, and so forth. The founders of religious traditions, such as Buddha or Jesus, have the same roles as the ancestors, gods and heroes in pre-Christian traditions of Europe because they established the prototypic paths for their followers. The initiate who follows the path is tuned in or aligns his nature with those who have walked this path before, and essentially its founder, thus embodying him. This taking on a new role is often symbolized by putting on new clothes in order to embody the spirit of the tradition, or to enter a new morphic field, if we were to use scientific terminology. All of this can also be observed in our native European customs and traditions, because despite the vast number of deities, not all of them were venerated at the same time by the same people. For example, although the female earth deities were respected by all, it was females who were initiated into the arts of the sacred feminine and its secret. It was them who, with their role in the household, with their activities of spinning and weaving, giving birth, educating the children, midwifery and so on, embodied the goddess. And like the initiates in various cults, so the women wore different clothes, or had their hair made in a different way in accordance to their social roles. Hence why in all cultures we have ceremonial clothes for occasions such as weddings, funerals, harvest and so forth. Another example would be that of the warrior caste, who embodied fully the nature of the deities of war and thunder, despite them being respected by all for various reasons because they were initiated into the arts of war and as such obtained the appropriate equipment and clothing. This also includes warriors who put on the skin of various animals such as wolves, bears, lions or wild boars to embody the spirit of these animals in battle. Likewise, we can speak of the ancestral cult which was common to all people but only a few were truly initiated into its secrets and could communicate with the dead, perform rituals, heal, and so forth. In certain initiation rituals, in order to gain access to the realm of the dead, people had to remove their clothes representing their bodies, and by doing so they symbolically died. Then they covered themselves with ashes or soot, and disguised themselves by wearing animal skins and masks in order to embody the dead, to become dead, and as such gain access into the burial mounds or caves where the rituals were performed. Upon finishing the hard trials of initiation, they returned and were given new clothes, and often new items or a new name, representing the rebirth and rebirth as a different social role. This custom of putting certain clothes on to embody something is essentially what we call imitative magic. But I believe that this is because we have not understood its scientific basis, because nobody except Sheldrake has made any effort in doing so. Certain deities were common to all people and they are usually guarded as higher than others. But like we have patron saints today, certain tribes, families or brotherhoods 
had their own patron deities, sometimes even local and unique. And they embodied these deities by the methods previously discussed. This was usually the case for the whole community who was divided in three castes, being the religious leaders on top, followed by the warrior caste, whose duty was to protect the community and the cult, and the commoners, that is to say, the free ordinary people who were agriculturists, craftsmen, herdsmen, and so forth, who were at the third level and the lowest level. The deities were therefore venerated accordingly because there was no need for warriors to be initiated in the agriculture cults or the other way around. At the top of the hierarchy was the sacred king, who was the highest priest and who represented the three castes as well. He was an embodiment of the divine Sky Father, a god incarnate, evident also from his ceremonial clothing and regalia, which survived the process of Christianization. Naturally, he had a crown representing the sun's rays and light, and a sword by which he symbolically transmitted this light and therefore blessed those upon whose shoulder it was placed. He also had a stone, originally a flint, representing the weapon of the storm god, of the thunder god, which later on became a hammer, axe, or mace of power, and eventually became a scepter which the Christian monarchs carried. The king, as a god incarnate, was not eternal, but could be challenged and replaced by someone better than him, following the specific rites. If the challenger defeated the king, the former king was originally killed, reenacting a prototypic myth of the death of a primordial being from whose body parts the world and the social castes were created. According to the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European cosmogenic myth, this primordial being was Yimo, meaning twin, who was sacrificed by his brother Manu, meaning man or progenitor of all mankind, in order to create the world. As such, Manu was regarded as the original priest, the one who performs the sacrifices, and Yimo as the original king, making them founders of the traditions. This myth is of course a reconstruction, and it developed in various ways among the different Indo-European people who adapted the myth and the tradition through time. Likewise, this myth should not be taken literally, but symbolically, as the creation of the cosmos can be a mythical allegory of the birth, or rather, rebirth of man. The rebirth of man, the king and the cosmos, through a sacrifice, essentially shows us that the cyclical worldview of our forebears was embedded in everything they did, because they understood the eternity of the present time, but naturally, as humans, they experienced time and divided it in past, present and future. In order to experience the division of time and the opposites in nature, one must be incarnated, because the spirit itself does not experience these opposites. This is why it is possible for us to tune into the memories of a certain sacred place and to bring the past into the present, if that place survives through time. Likewise, this is why we can sometimes have dreams in which we can see future events. It is through these visions or dreams that a seer would predict the future or see the past, because the spirit, the psyche, is not bound by time, hence also why we can have out-of-body experiences. This was known by our forebears, and it is nicely illustrated in the Platonic Doctrine. The Platonic Doctrine of the Soul states that before birth, the soul is unified as a sphere, because the opposites do not yet exist. Upon incarnation, the original shape of the sphere is lost, the unity is no longer there. 
this shows us that the spirit or soul or psyche before incarnation does not experience duality and therefore time, meaning that it itself is timeless and loses its unity once incarnated in a human body which perceives duality through the senses. The Platonists also say that the psyche travels between the world of the living and the dead along the Milky Way. The Milky Way intersects the astrological zodiac in Cancer and Capricorn, the two gates of the Sun. The first gate of Cancer is the gate of man, while the second gate of Capricorn is the gate of the gods. The spirits descend on Earth through the first gate of Cancer when they are reborn, and through the second gate of Capricorn they return to the other world when people die. The idea that the Milky Way is the road to the other world is evident in many cultures across the world. That this is not purely a Platonist tradition can be seen from the South Slavic tradition where the Milky Way has several names, one of which is Jovanova Struga. The name Jovan refers to Saint John, while the word Struga means stream, current, canal or riverbed. Therefore, the name could simply be translated as John's River. According to traditional Serbian folk belief, the spirits of the dead depart from the world to the other world following this heavenly stream, or John's River. And it is Saint Nicholas in the role of a ferryman who ferries the souls from this world to the other world. Like in the Platonist tradition, the two main holidays dedicated to St. John in the Slavic Orthodox Christian Julian calendar are the 24th of June during the period of Cancer and the 7th of January during the period of Capricorn. The souls therefore travel along the river led by Nicholas who will take them to John, who will open the winter sun gate that leads to the other world, and when incarnating, the souls travel across the river again and come into our world. According to the Serbian ethnologist Veselin Čekanović, originally it was the deity Veles who performed the roles of both of these saints. The travel between the worlds of the dead and the living on a ship can be found all over Europe even in funerary rituals in which the dead were cremated or buried in ships. This mythological image of a cosmic voyage to the other world is a symbol, a metaphor to illustrate what happens after we die or before we are born. Because as we saw in the previous lecture, the womb of the mother was seen as a microcosmic image of the macrocosm of the universe. Therefore, these symbols can also be understood in the light of the inner microcosmic processes during pregnancy and childbirth, that is, the incarnation of the soul for the microcosm and the macrocosm are one, or as the saying goes, as above, so below. And there are several different mythical metaphors which describe the departure and incarnation of spirits, one of which is that of the migratory birds, which was mentioned in the previous lecture as well. The flight of the spirit is associated with that of the bird which migrates the evergreen other world during winter, and which shall in return to our world in spring just like the spirits will incarnate in the future generations. This is why the ancestral spirits are often represented as sitting upon the branches of a cosmic tree in the form of birds. It is simply a metaphor to show that the spirits reside in timelessness, that they are internal and part of the collective ancestral sum represented by the tree, which on a macrocosmic scale is the universe itself, whereas on a microcosmic level it appears as the placenta. Hence why the tree is always associated with a deity, such as Triglav in Slavic mythology, and it is often called grandfather, 
The myth of Odin hanging on the tree Yggdrasil and falling represents the same. He hangs in eternity, he is the ancestral spirit being reborn in the child. You see, our ancestors used such metaphors, such symbols like birds on a tree or a perfect sphere as images for the spirit because it is impossible to describe that which is timeless with conventional language, for it too is a process in time, whereas the symbol is eternal and arises spontaneously. And when you live in a realm in which you experience the passing of time, you use something which seems timeless in relation to your experience of time to express the concept of eternity. And the most common symbols used for eternity are the tree, the mountain and the stone, which often go together. In order to better understand this, we must understand how our ancestors lived. Our earliest hunter-gatherer ancestors were nomadic, and they often traveled the same routes following herds of animals. But along these travels, they always visited the same places which they regarded as sacred, such as mountains, waterfalls, ancient trees, and so forth. They were the first temples, but also places for navigation for the many generations who followed the same routes. So in relation to a man's lifetime, they were eternal. Later on, when people settled and lived in larger communities, these places continued to be regarded as sacred for the same reason. Ancient trees in particular were used as holy places, especially when accompanied by a body of water underneath or nearby, because as such, the whole place embodied the cosmological order, the water being the entrance to the underworld, with the tree growing up towards the sky. The tree became an archetype and symbol of eternity, of the sum of the ancestors and the universe itself, because it was eternal in relation to man's lifetime, because rituals were performed there, generation after generations for thousands of years, all of which performed the same rites, using the same words, the same objects, as their forebears did. And because of this, they were able to tap into the memory of the holy place and bring the past into the present. They remembered themselves. As time went by, certain European people built temples to house the images of the deities but they were also built on these places, following architectural principles which embodied the cosmic order, and always had to have a sacred tree standing nearby. This tradition of visiting the holy places one generation after another is where pilgrimage originates from, practiced in many religions today. The sacred tree represented the totality of the pagan man's psyche, which is why in certain parts of Europe the first thing the Christians did was to cut down the ancient trees and build churches with the wood, which resulted in a traumatic change in consciousness from which we have never recovered. In other parts of Europe, like in some South Slavic lands, the sacred tree often became an essential component of the church or its substitute in case of absence, and remains as such to this day. This is simply an example of the conservative nature of Orthodox Christianity in the Slavic lands, which preserved a lot of pre-Christian concepts, customs and ritual within it. When we consider that one of the most important features of our pre-Christian tradition is to maintain the close similarity to the prototypic mythical past, it is easy to understand why Christianity is so strong in the Orthodox Slavic countries, compared to, for example, Protestant countries, where almost nobody is Christian anymore. It is simply because it is more pagan, that is to say, due to its conservative nature, it resonates more with what is originally pre-Christian, 
and which is still very much alive in the collective unconscious of the people. Keeping all of this in mind, we can say that the pre-Christian European view of the divine differs from that of the Abrahamic view in the sense that it does not place it beyond and above nature, but regards nature as infinitely deep and spiritual in the true sense of the word. As such, the European approach uses nature to tap into eternity, to bring the past into the present and therefore bring back to life the honorable dead. Likewise, the European view is not based on historical progress and development towards an ideal end, but on the acknowledgement that the only real time is the present and that it is eternal. It is, has been and will always be. And we cannot name it for language is incompetent of grasping its essence. Instead, it appears as a symbol of the cosmic axis and it connects us with the divine here and now with our divine ancestors through blood and memory, which is essentially our real, immortal and divine self in a unity with the universe. Given the circumstances of the time we live in, it is not easy to completely revive the cult and traditions of our forebears. Firstly, because they do not fit the lifestyle we have, but also because, in many cases, it would not be possible. The only thing we can do is to revive and maintain the knowledge in various ways, and use it to enrich our lives in the best way possible. Times have always changed along with societies and people. And despite the differences and threats, our traditions have adapted through time, but maintained the primordial core. It is up to us to keep the fire burning in these difficult times, to spread the knowledge, to honor the past by celebrating the festivals with our family, and pass it all down to the future generations. For a tree cannot grow without roots. Thank you for listening. I hope that this lecture expanded your understanding on the topic. And I hope to see you here for the next video. Please consider subscribing, liking and sharing this video. And remember to check out my other books on paganism if you're interested in learning more. Goodbye. But I bet you didn't know that goodbye stems from God be with you. Well, that's all I have to say for the end. May the gods be with you.